Okay. So, in case I don't make it exactly on time and it's 10 minutes, I'm giving away the take-home message on the first slide. So, in fact, we believe that using transcriptomics, in, in fact, the same nanostring platform as the previous speaker, can show that there is indeed persistent SARS-CoV-2 RNA in the blood, and it can also allow us to identify some candidate clinical biomarkers which might be useful in the long term. So, um, because like we've seen it before in the word cloud, uh, just in the previous session, what is missing, definitely biomarkers comes up. So, first of all, there are several flavors of biomarkers, and then diagnostic biomarkers, maybe of viral persistence, would be very helpful. And the question is, where should we biopsy them? So there's an S missing there. So, of course, the CNS is a bit difficult. Nobody wants to voluntarily give their uh, CSF or respiratory. Bulk fluid, as you know, is not very easy to access either, intestinal samples. So we do believe that blood samples might be the most convenient ones, especially for large and ongoing cohort studies. A second flavor that is needed is biomarkers that can guide treatment whether that is antivirals, anti-inflammatory, or anticoagulant. And then finally, we would need predictive biomarkers. We've been talking about recovery, about discharging patients, are they cured, are they recovered? So we need actually predictive biomarkers that can allow us to monitor clinical evolution, which could be like objectively quantified by imaging of the brain, for instance, or also the famous PRO patient reported outcomes. We do believe they are both equally important. And then from a practical point of view, they should be preferably non-invasive and affordable. So uh, why transcriptomics? Um, I think transcriptomics is not better or worse than all the other omics that have been discussed like in previous sessions and in next sessions, obviously. What we do believe is that transcriptome is different from the genome because it's not fixed and it's different in each tissue and it's highly dynamic and it provides also a snapshot of the ongoing host viral interplay. And besides being tissue specific, which comes in handy when you want to have a very specific biomarker. And we're also venturing in the other proteomics and cell-based assays, but for now, transcriptomes. About our study design, uh, we, we believe we have some peculiar strengths and limitations. Uh, first of all, it's a real-world cohort. This is actually based uh, in, a, in a general practice for both our patients and the match controls, which allows us to get very detailed electronic health courts, health records, sorry, several uh, decades of follow-up. Uh, we don't have data on treatment adherence because it's outside of a clinical trial or previous over-the-counter treatments, which we know patients are actually taking. And we also don't have a sample at the acute COVID stage. Um, however, we do have validated clinical scales, scales sorry, for both the clinicians, the Duke University a Severity of Illness, and also patient-reported outcomes of COPE charts. Um, we were able to quantify uh, some of the neurocognitive effects objectively by brain imaging using SPECT. And we also had a uniform treatment scheme for all the patients in the cohort, which was first line using uh, these drugs, Azaflo, Piracetam, and Clopidogrel, which actually all are acting mostly on platelets and coagulation. And a uh, second line, Paxlovid, but I should say this is off-label use. So, uh, transcriptomics, here we go again, it's an nanostring platform. I know it's a very busy slide, so I'll take you through it uh, in steps. So, here on the x-axis, we have the LOX fold change. Anything that's here to the right is higher in the long COVID patients. Wow, this is really slow. So, all these genes are higher in long COVID patients, and all the genes here on the left are higher in our matched controls. And, in fact, on this axis, you see the significance, so the higher we are up here, the more significant, statistically speaking, these genes are. And in fact, what you see in red here are viral proteins. So we do find several viral RNAs, the so nucleocapsid, ORF7A, ORF3A, as you see here in these red dots. And we also find antisense RNA, which suggests that it's maybe ongoing viral replication in the blood. Also associated host proteins such as the co-receptors, uh, Tempris 2 and the TPP4, furin, very uh, famous proteins that are involved in the viral processing. And then last but not least, we also find here significantly uh, increase in the patients MPRO, which is a viral protease, the actual target of Paxlovid. 
Now, when you look at the green dots, these are actually genes expressed in memory B cells, meaning that there is an ongoing um, antibody production. But also, what we see here is the heavy chain transcript of Ig, and that again, of course, nicely links to allergies, asthmas, histamine links, which I just heard from uh, colleagues at UCL, and we heard in the previous talks as well. So I do think this matches very well with the sudden onset of allergies and asthma that patients have been reporting. And then uh, last but not least, there is in yellow here, we see several platelet genes, which are again an obvious link to coagulation, but maybe also to the viral reservoir. So, of course, this was very busy. There were all more than 800 genes. What happens if you try to simplify this and actually translate all of these 800 genes in simple biological pathways? And one of them is, of course, immunometabolism. And we quantify this in the controls and in the long COVID patients, first of all, I should say, matching is very important. So these controls were matched for age, sex, time since acute COVID, vaccine status, and also comorbidities, which was, I think, a unique asset of this GP-based cohort. And as you can see, in the green uh, dots, there is a very homogeneous response and positive response. So if we give a score to metab metabolism, it's positive and very a similar in all of the controls, whereas you can see it's very heterogeneous in all of the long COVID patients being extremely negative in a few of them. And the same goes for lymphocyte activation, very homogeneous in our controls. We have a few outliers on the upper side on both scores, but most of the patients, in fact, 50% of them had like a deficient score in their immune metabolism and lymphocyte activation. So, uh, when we tried to link the viral RNA to these uh, pathways, we found, in fact, there was a very significant negative uh, correlation between the viral load. This is actually a log scale, which is quite high. This is over 1,000 counts of the virus and their immunometabolism. So probably this could be due, uh, as, uh, this could show exhaustion due to chronic immune activation. On the other hand, we found a very significant positive correlation this time between these viral RNAs and uh, very specific platelet genes, which could be linked to the possible viral reservoir according to <laughs> recent data from the bomb cell group in Paris. So um, very briefly, multivariable logistic regression, of course, we need to correct for several uh, factors, showed us that H and sex were not an influence on the high versus low RNA, but uh, comorbidities were. Each comorbidity raises the odds of having high viral RNA by 61%, as you can see in the red data, whereas each dose of the vaccine lowers the odds of having this viral RNA by 64%. So clinical correlations, what you can see here is a, a SPECT image showing low vascular flow in a specific long COVID patients as compared to uh, matched uh, age and sex uh, paired controls. What we find when we now classify our patients in having this image, so having a low vascular flow spec positive, is in fact again a metabolic and a platelet link. Here, as you can see, this is the insulin receptor, which is higher in the patients with uh, shown brain um, damage, spec positive. And also, this is the gene for P-selectin, which, as you know, has been shown at the protein level by several groups, including the Pretorius group. But several people have shown that this molecule, which actually the GPS molecule showing platelets where to locate, is again higher in the patients with uh, objective brain damage. So confirming the links. So I'm almost out of time. So what about the protease, which is the target of Paxlovid? So I'll get you through this very busy slide just by summarizing that this uh, Protease RNA was highly correlated with all the other RNAs, including antisense, so probably it is part of an ongoing replication. It is also correlated to the ACE2 receptor, which is striking, but that's usually absent in the blood. So maybe these are circulating endothelial or epithelial cells, we don't know yet. And it also correlates very nicely with now, this time, uh, patient-reported outcomes. So as I told you about the COOP scales, this is one of the five uh, components is called fitness. So the patient report whether they are feeling fit or not. And in fact, higher scores are patients doing worse. So patients doing worse, having low levels of self-declared fitness, have higher levels of the viral protease. And then uh, I'm going to just skip to this and go to 
The question, can Paxlovid now revert any of these four biological events? And the answer is yes. So going back to the colors, these are the genes that were higher in long COVID patients in red, and in green are the genes that were higher in the controls. So if you compare, compare the fold changes before and after Paxlovid, we found that in fact all the negative ones are corrected and all the, the positive ones are being increased. So there is a partial a normalization of both the viral RNAs, but then surprisingly the only outlier is the antisense, so the replicative marker. So maybe they're still replicating virus and that might maybe also explain the rebound we see with Paxlovid. Uh, we see lower expression of these ACE2 and Tempress co-receptors. We also revert some of these long COVID RNA changes. I'm not going into detail. Um, of course, this was just a small number of patients. It was outside of a clinical trial. So we do need more patients and longer follow-up. And then maybe we can do also a Belgian or European even uh, placebo-controlled, preferably Paxlovid trial. Okay, so conclusions. Okay. We do believe there is systemic viral persistence in the blood. We have only shown at RNA, not protein level. We do uh, see a uh, strong perturbated immune response, mostly diminished immune metabolism, but no immunosuppression. We do propose a few biomarkers, which could be used in other cohorts, such as the insulin receptor P-selectin. And then finally, these predictive biomarkers should be tested, of course, in larger cohorts before and after treatments, preferably um, with blood draws before and after. Then rapidly acknowledging the clinicians, especially Mark Chamou, uh, all the patients, the controls, and all the colleagues who have worked on this. Thank you for your attention.